Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the City of Muskegon City Commission meeting for May 8, 2018. Before we begin the proceedings, I'd like to invite up our good friend, uh, George Monroe from Evanston Avenue Baptist Church to lead us in prayer. And that will be followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Shall we pray? Our dear Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this privilege, Lord, that we can be here, Lord, we pray that you would undertake by our mayor and our manager, our commissioners and our folk, Lord, that you would protect them and their families at all times. Now, be with this meeting, Lord, that you would have the wisdom as to these things that will be handled. We'll give the other praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thanks so much, George. Can we have the roll call, please? Mayor Galrin? Here. Vice Mayor Hood? Here. Commissioner Warren? Here. Commissioner German? Here. Commissioner Rinsa Vasipiga? Here. Commissioner Turnquist? Here. Commissioner Johnson? Here. Hey, everybody's here. Hey, we have a uh, presentation this evening uh, regarding our pollinator plan. Who's up on that? Kevin Santos, Municipal Services. Good to see you, Kevin. Good to see you. So I believe everyone has a copy of the plan in hand and probably has reviewed it. We had it a couple, couple of weeks Basically, ago. Basically, I guess we could just go over a couple of points on it. Um, we started this conversation at Municipal Services some time ago about uh, trying to diversify our landscape management plan so that we're including pollinators. So pollinators are basically a diverse group of species, including butterflies, moths, bats even, uh, anything that facilitates reproduction of plants. So obviously when most people think of this, they think of bees, and that's kind of where we're looking at um, our goals to be around as far as protecting our bee species and our urban habitats and creating habitat for them. So what we've tried to do is just come up with some objectives based on our experience with the different pollinators that we, and, and the different species of plants that we're used to dealing with. Probably since around 2011, we started planting uh, more flowering, you know, more decorative landscape type trees in the city of Muskegon to replace some of the ones that we've lost on the terraces, some of the ones that we've lost in like, uh, you know, on Seaway Drive or when we've had um, more recently some, um, some emerald ash borer remediation. We're trying to replace those, spe those, those species with other species that produce flowers and that will help facilitate our, our, our pollinators. So our objectives here have basically been to, you know, identify and develop, um, I guess, cost saving measures that um, will help increase healthy <laughs> pollinator habitat in the city of Muskegon. And um, by doing that, we've developed these goals. So our goals are to increase that habitat, increase that diversity with sustain sustainable plantings um, and kind of plantings that we can, we can put out there that are not gonna require a whole lot from us. So we're looking at species that are drought resistant that are you know, good for spaces where we don't necessarily have irrigation. We're also looking at potentially putting out uh, more of this stuff so that we are reducing our, our mowing because right now we're mowing a ton of stuff and we, necessarily, we don't necessarily have to. So that's kind of another one of our goals when we're, when we're talking about this. Um, pesticide use is a big one too and we're, we're looking at measures to reduce the amount of pesticides that we're using. And we've been doing this for quite some time. Um, what we're also doing is looking at more organic measures too so that uh, there are people in our community who have allergies who don't necessarily react well to pesticides. I don't think anybody do. Anybody does really, but we're looking at the organic measures that we can use more of inside the city to kind of reduce our pesticide load, which is really bad for pollinators. So um, there's been a lot of new research and there's ongoing research too and we're continuing to look at those efforts. And then the, uh, the final component, <coughs> is really about educating the public. So uh, in doing so, we're looking at, obviously signage is included in the plan, but we're also looking at putting out some stuff on our website. We're looking at some community engagement type activities with, uh, with local schools 
Um, I really would love to get some more schools involved to help us do the planting so that they can also see and hear us talk about the different measures and different um, types of strategies that we're looking at as far as these plans go. So we're looking at basically for this year, we've talked about a budget to cover seven areas inside the city of Muskegon. Um, Grand Trunk, some of these are really organic too. Grand Trunk boat launch uh, is mentioned in the, in the plan and that actually is going to, to happen uh, next Friday uh, at Grand Trunk, it's the annual Grand Trunk cleanup day. Mm -hmm. So we'll have people from Windsor Dick there, we'll have people from the, uh, the, the Sappy Union and we're gonna have a bunch of school kids there. We're gonna be doing all kinds of plantings. They're gonna be doing cleanup as well, but the plantings are gonna be a big part of that. And some of those plantings are actually gonna be from, uh, from <coughs> plants that we have, I don't know if you're aware of this, but we do have a small nursery at City of Muskegon that we started years ago. So a lot of these species are gonna be coming out of there. They're now mature enough. I mean, when I got them, they were like that big. And now they're you know 10 feet tall or whatever. So we're gonna be using some of those at that site. Again, it's just something that's gonna happen. We do this every year and it's great that we've got community engagement at this point. We're gonna have school kids there. We're gonna have a lot of people from the community to give us a hand to plant at that site and really clean it up and make it look nice and also make it a nice, nicer habitat um, for our, our pollinator species. Um, Hartstrom Point is kind of the same way. We have a, um, <coughs> we have a, 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 a conservation easement there. Um, so we're basically, we've put in a number of different species that would be considered uh, pollinator friendly, like dogwoods, flowering dogwoods, and some other small um, shrub type bushes there. We're also gonna be putting some more stuff in there and just trying to, to basically add to that diversity and also stabilize the erosion issues that we're having along that section. Um, some of these other ones, we're still talking to people from the state of Michigan, like Seaway and Shoreline Drive, Interchange, and Moses J. Uh, Jones Parkway. This is also an effort to reduce our mowing costs. So by planting these areas, uh, we're hoping to reduce that, but also this is part of the public uh, <coughs> engagement component that we, we really wanna make sure that the public is aware of what we're trying to do, and this is where our signage will come in and our public engagement type uh, campaigns where we're telling people, you know, we're not doing this to make it look rougher, we're doing it to beautify it. So Ryerson Creek is another one that, uh, another area that we are also working in coordination with a couple different community uh, groups to add um, some really nice components to that area, spruce it up a little bit. <coughs> Richards Park, um, Richards Park is really, a, a We've been, we've been putting different uh, species in Richard Park for about 10 years. And you know I know it's kind of at the edge of our city limits and it's over the Ottawa Street Bridge, but Richard's Park is really, as far as habitat and diversity goes, it's really a great little park. I mean, there's, there are different components there and we've got all kinds of different, um, uh, different flowering trees and bushes there. So uh, we hope to continue adding to that. Usually we, we'll take, um, you know, something out of the nursery there and put it there every year. And it always thrives because it's so wet. You know, we don't have to do anything to it, so. And then Marquette Avenue, um, some of you probably will remember a number of years ago, consumers came in um, when they were adding the new transmission lines and they took down all of the trees along the south side of the road. So that one, we're hoping that we can, we can use that as a target area for a grant. Um, which would be in the fall, and then probably put back in, you know, I kind of have a, a half plan put together where we'd be talking about, um, you know, flowering plum trees and flowering pears, some really nice diverse color arrangements there, um, and really, you know, make that section pop for people coming down, up and down Marquette. I guess the last component, there are maps of all these areas in the, in the plan, obviously. Um, the educational component, we're still looking, we're still working with a couple of different organizations about purchasing signs or possibly producing our own signage. Um, but we want to make sure that, that those components are out there for the public to see and, uh, and that they're you know, out there to engage our community so that they are aware of what we're, we're trying to accomplish. I think that pretty much covers it. I'll, I'll take any questions, of course. Any questions for Mr. Santos? Commissioner Turner. The kickoff is like a week from Friday. That would be correct. At, at Grand Trunk. Yep. And it goes through the entire summer. 
Uh, the planting of the trees, when will that occur? The best time to plant trees is in the early spring or in the late fall. So um, we are we are working with, well, shrubs can be a little bit different. We can do some shrubbage, you know, during the hot months, but we're gonna try and reduce that to those two times so that we make sure that we get the most out of our, our plant species. Because if a tree will get stressed real easy uh, in the hot months, so we don't wanna, we don't, we wanna minimize our loss, basically. So probably we won't see trees until the fall. <coughs> we're gonna see some trees next week and then we probably won't see too many more until the fall, correct? Anyone else? Commissioner Warren? Um, can this plan that you're referring to be put on the website so people or businesses that are interested in looking at it can look at the resources as well? Absolutely. The plan's available in PDF. It's the same copy that everyone here has. Okay. So we can place it on the website. Um, we're really hoping that uh, to make this work and that to build on it because, you know, this line of research is fairly new. Um, and the, the best management strategies are still being worked out. So we're, we're using the ones that are available to us at this point, but I'm sure that more will be developed. So we're gonna continue trying to do that research and our due diligence to find out what the, what the best strategies are. I'm hoping that this overall is gonna be at some point recognized as more of a, a comprehensive landscaping management plan so that we can have some kind of uniformity at the city of Muskegon when we're doing this kind of stuff. Um, and our number one goal obviously too is to obviously diversify uh, the, the different kinds of things that we're putting, you know, in our green spaces. Very good. Go right ahead. Um, I was also sent to pass on a message of sincere gratitude. Um, there's a lot of residents and um, urban farmers and some of our local gardens that are really excited um, that the city is so proactive about supporting our pollinators. So thank you on behalf of those individuals and myself as well. Yeah, much appreciated. And I, I will pass that along to the other people at Municipal Services that really put a lot of work into this too, so. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I just wanna echo those thanks um, as well to you and staff on, on that. Um, the city certainly tries to be as eco-friendly as possible and um, live harmoniously with nature. Um, and I think this is really an important initiative, not only in beautifying um, our, our community, but um, in terms of helping sustain pollinators and the, the critical role they play in our food production, um, as well as potentially saving us money, you know, if we can uh, reduce uh, grass cuttings, um, which got me thinking when you brought that up, um, something that um, a, a woman with regard to the disc golf issue at McGrath Park, which maybe we'll get into later in any other business, um, had had stated on my commission page, I read it just before I got here, something about um, mowing around the trees um, and the, the um, the weed cutters or the weed whippers um, potentially damaging the, the bark and making it susceptible to oak wilt in that regard. And so perhaps, I don't know, something just for, for staff to consider is maybe we do put wildflowers around the base of the trees instead of having grass there um, so we don't have to bring that, that equipment there and potentially um, create another way for oak wilt to, to get into the trees. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, our policy as far as weed trimming, line trimming, string trimming around trees is we don't do it. So if there's somebody, uh, I manage the cemeteries also and our cemeteries are predominantly oak trees. Um, but it doesn't matter the species, if somebody's trimming around a tree then I wanna know about it and then I'll deal with it from there. But our policy is to not trim around trees because it does wound them. Um, I've got examples all over town where people have done that, uh, even sometimes from our own side, and we've had to go in and make, take corrective measures to, to make sure that they're not doing that. Okay, good to know. I, I, good to know, and um, maybe reiterate that with staff, because this woman had said she heard it from a Parks and Rec personnel that this is happening, um, and so maybe just reiterate that uh, to, to staff to be careful around the bases of our trees. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I appreciate all your work. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Very good, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, Thank you for all the efforts in it. Uh, I, if, if we can start seeing an increase in our friends, the bees, I, I've seen one uh, that landed on a bumblebee this uh, Saturday, and I was happy to see him for the spring. So, uh, yeah. No, I, I, I think we also wanted to emphasize too that just because we're talking about pollinators and we're talking about you know having more bees around doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to create a situation where it's going to become hazardous for the public to you know enter the right. farmers market or something. We're, we're we've got much more responsible methods for you know creating habitat space in areas that you really want to be out of the way. You know you, we don't want to crowd uh, the two. So. 
we're keeping that in mind at least. Very good. One, one final question. Yes. Um, so have you suspended the pesticide usage on, on the, around the farmer's market and other facilities already? Um, or is that being phased in or we've switched to non-toxic pesticides or? We're what? using, we're, we're not suspending it. What we're using is a different mix of, um, of chemicals, herbicides. So, uh, and we're also doing it at earlier times and later in the fall so that we can try and uh, reduce the amount of exposure that bees or beetles or moths or butterflies or you name it has to those chemicals. So as long as we can do that, you know, that's the most really, that's what the best management practices are leading us to believe that there are these specific times that are best to do this, um, make these applications, and then we're trying to keep the, our applications done there and not over the course of an entire summer or the, the really heavy months okay. for pollinators. Right. Okay. That's going to make a lot of folks happy. I do hear some yeah, concerns about yep. um, breathing in this when they visit the market. Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. well, again, thank you very much, uh, Kevin, and okay. pre appreciate this, uh, this, this innovation. My pleasure. I really do. Thank you. <coughs> May we have the consent agenda, please? Approval of minutes, City Clerk, summary request to approve minutes of the April 24, 2018 regular meeting. Staff recommendation, approval of the minutes. Request to fly the Norwegian flag, yeah. City Clerk, summary request. Sons of Norway are requesting permission to fly the Norwegian flag at City Hall on Thursday, May 17th in honor of Norway's Constitution Day, Independence Day. Staff recommendation, approval of the request. <laughs> approval of building contract for 1015 East Forest Avenue, Community and Neighborhood Services, summary request. To award the building contract for the rehabilitation of 1015 East Forest Avenue to hold in construction for the City of Muskegon's Home Buyers Program through CNS. CNS received three bids. The cost estimate from our spec writer was $98,100. Staff recommendation to award the Holden Construction, the Rehabilitation <coughs> Contract for 1015 East Forest in the amount of $73,250 for the Community and Neighborhood Services Office. Toro Groundmaster Mower, DPW Equipment. Summary request. The Equipment Division is requesting permission to purchase one Toro Groundmaster Mower coming for coming for Spartan distributors, the lowest qualified bidder. Cost of this mower is $31,737.32 coming from the Equipment Division Fund. Staff recommendation, authorize staff to purchase one Toro Groundmaster mower from Spartan distributors, the lowest qualified bidder. 2018-2019 Healthcare and Wellness Program Finance Director. Summary of request. The city's health care coverage renews effective June 1st for the period June 1st, 2018 until May 31st, 2019. This year's priority health renewal premium came in at a 7.64% increase over the previous year. Last year's increase was 3.96% after several benefit changes were made. For several years, the city has made numerous benefit changes, including increasing deductibles and copays, along with changes to the drug copays to keep our insurance as low as possible. This year, to help offset the cost, we are proposing to increase the employee's premium copay from 10% to 14%. This will keep our employee contribution below the hard cap limits set by PA 152. Per state guidelines, we must remain below the hard cap limit or employees must contribute 20% towards their premium. To stay below the hard cap limit would require significant benefit changes each year, so we are opting to gradually increase the employee premium copay until it reaches the 20% we feel well, we feel this option will have less negative impact on the majority of employees. For 2018-19, the city will continue to pay the HRA deductible if the employee and spouse complete the wellness requirements by March 31st. Non-participants participants in the wellness program will be required to pay $1,000 for single coverage or $2,000 per double or family coverage of the deductible. Staff recommendation, authorize staff to execute documents with Priority Health to renew employee health care coverage for the coming year. Set public hearing for amendment to Brownfield Plan, Pigeon Hill, Planning and Economic Development. A summary request to approve the resolution setting a public hearing for an amendment for the Brownfield Plan and notifying taxing jurisdictions of the Brownfield Plan amendment, including the opportunity to express their views and recommendations regarding the proposed amendments at the public hearing. The amendment is for the inclusion of the property owned by Pigeon Hill Brewing Company, LLC, located at 895 4th Street in the Brownfield Plan. Staff recommendation to approve the resolution and authorize the mayor and clerk to sign the resolution. 
Committee recommendation. The Brownfield Redevelopment Authority met on May 8, 2018 and approved the Brownfield Plan Amendment and recommends the approval of the Brownfield Plan Amendment to the Muskegon City Commission. Remembrance Road Preliminary and Construction Engineering, Department of Public Works. Summary request. Authorize staff to enter into an agreement with Moore and Brudrink for preliminary and construction engineering services related to the reconstruction and widening of Remembrance Road from Keating South to a new project site in the Port City Industrial Park. The requested consultant is requ currently working on the site development, has familiarity with the needs of, for the project site, and has submitted a reasonable cost estimate for the work. Staff recommendation, authorize staff to enter into an agreement with Moran Brugink for engineering services related to the reconstruction and widening of, widening of a remembrance road. <coughs> Elsie Walker Arena Improvement, City Manager. Summary request. Staff is seeking approval to make a number of investments at the Elsie Walker Arena during the 2018 off-season. The improvements include updated ADA seating, demolition and removal of old unused HVAC equipment, painting and ceiling repairs. In addition to these improvements, staff will be requesting funds from the Downtown Development Authority to replace the glass around the playing surface, replace ice controllers, upgrade restrooms, reconfigure a portion of the arena seating, and improve food and beverage offerings. Collectively, these items are expected to help improve the fan visitor experience and move the arena closer to self-sustainability. ADA improvements are $20,000, paint $120,000, selective demolition $30,000, ceiling repairs $60,000. Staff recommendation to authorize the city manager to expend up to $230,000 for ADA seating upgrades, miscellaneous demolition, painting, and ceiling repairs at the LC Walker Arena. Amity Bridge, resolution of support for bridge funding application and commitment for matching funds, Department of Public Works. Summary of request. The engineering department would like to apply for bridge preservation funding through the Michigan Department of Transportation. These funds would be used to remove the Amity Bridge and to build a new roadway on fill. The bridge was originally constructed to cross a railroad line that no longer exists. Construction is estimated at $415,000 and the city would be required to provide matching funds of approximately $90,000 plus engineering costs. Funding is available starting in 2021. The MDOT application requires a resolution of support and commitment for the matching funds. Staff recommendation, approve the resolution of support for the Bridge Preservation Fund application and commit <coughs> to funding the required match and engineering cost. Medical Marijuana Facilities Licensing applica Act application, planning and economic development. Summary request, request to approve the proposed local MMFLA application. Staff recommendation to pass the resolution approving the application. Commissioners, you've heard the co consent agenda as presented. Are there any items you wish to have removed for further discussion? Commissioner German? Yeah, item uh, I and J. Are there any others? Commissioner Johnson? There are no others. I move to approve the consent agenda as presented, minus items I and J. <coughs> it has been moved by Commissioner Johnson. I need a second, don't I? Support. And it's been supported by Commissioner Warren to accept the consent agenda as presented minus items I and J. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Vice Mayor Hood? Yes. Commissioner Warren? Yes. Commissioner German? Uh, yes. Commissioner Ritson Mississippiga? Yes. Commissioner Turnquist? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Mayor Galrin? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Item I, Commissioner German? Here. There it is right there. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Okay, I move to uh let's see. That's not it. Is it that one right there? Oh the recommendation, there we go. Okay, I move to approve the resolution to support for the bridge preservation funding application and commit to the funding requirements match, required match, and engineering costs. Support. It's been moved by Commissioner German, seconded by Commissioner Warren to approve the resolution of support for the bridge preservation fund application and commit the funding to funding the requested uh, or the required match and engineering cost. Commissioner German? Yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm not familiar with that bridge, so could you just give me some insight where this bridge is at and um, why the necessary need to um, repair this 
I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch the last need part of that. For funding for this bridge, and I'm not just kind of enlighten me where this bridge is located. Um, I don't know exactly the cross streets. Sorry, I wasn't thinking that that was going to come up. Um, yeah, spring, spring, spring. Oh, yeah, as you say, I know it's close, it but okay. Okay, right. I just wanted to make sure I, we were aware. <laughs> this is the same bridge that crosses. Uh, the old train tracks yes. comes into exactly. the downtown area. Okay. Right. All right. So. Right. So since the train tracks aren't there anymore, um, there is some preservation work that is required on the bridge. Um, there's some leaking joints and the deck needs to be patched, but we would really prefer to just remove the bridge. That way we don't have the future maintenance costs for that bridge. We'd rather just remove it and, and build the roadway on fill because there's no need for the bridge to be there anymore. So, so if you remove the bridge and we're looking at some type of roadway, I mean, we still have that like under overpass, uh, you know, and that area down there has really been neglected uh, for so many years, and it really needs some type of beautification. Have that even been considered also um, as part of your project? Uh, right now, we're just we're just looking at removing the bridge. We can certainly look at the. The railroad line to see what could be done. As far as I know, the city doesn't own that property. I, would, I think that the DNR does. Mm -hmm. So I don't. I'm not sure what we'd be allowed to do, but we could certainly look into something. Are there any drawing or uh, photos or anything uh, uh, what this uh, project would look like once completed? Not at this time. We haven't done any engineering on it. This, the funding wouldn't be available until 2021. So this is just to apply for the funding. So the engineering wouldn't take place for another couple of years. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for the director, Commissioner Johnson? Um, not pertaining to the bridge itself per se or the allocation, but just you know, got me thinking with it being former rail line there, um, and we've done the rail to trails program in the past, and I remember a few years ago some discussion of possibly that rail line that goes through there that goes through the McLaughlin neighborhood and the Angel neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you're, you're relatively new at the city, so you don't have the historical knowledge of, of that from right. years ago. Right. Um, but um, I don't know if, if staff has any historical knowledge of that, or if, if Frank does, or um, I don't know. Since this isn't going to be developed for another two years or so when we actually reconstruct that road, um, I don't know. That might be something just to keep in mind about uh, potential grant monies um, of creating bike trails um, on that former rail line. We actually have given that some consideration because we, um, when we looked at the possibility of removing the bridge, we talked about should we replace it with maybe <laughs> something smaller, a culvert with some fill on top of it. Um, but we really think that we can accommodate a trail without having to have the bridge. Yeah. So, you know, we're certainly open to looking at trail options. We're always looking for those kinds of things. We just didn't think that it was necessary to keep the bridge and al to allow for a trail. Yeah, agreed. And I wasn't trying to say we need to okay. not do the bridge in order <laughs> well, sure, to do the trail. We can still look, sure. But just something to be mindful mm -hmm. of as we do the, the right. fill with yep. the bridge, or sure. replacement of the bridge. So thank you. Sure, you're welcome. Very good. Anything else? Okay. Thank you, Director. You're welcome. Roll call, please. Commissioner Warren? Yes. Commissioner German? Yes. Commissioner Ms. Masibiga? Yes. Commissioner Turnquist? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Mayor Gullrin? Yes. Vice Mayor Hood? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Item J, Commissioner German. Uh, yes, I move to um, approve the request to approve the proposed local MMFLA application. Support. <coughs> it's been moved by Commissioner German, seconded by Commissioner Johnson. I think this is to approve the resolution approving the application, correct? Yeah. Okay. Commissioner German. Okay. I know we had some discussion on this yesterday. I just want to get clarification, make sure when I vote, you know, everything is clear. Now, because um, I see on the agenda a second reading. Now, this here is um, item J is the application that we made all the changes to, or? Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to try mm -hmm. to sneak this on to the consent. Um, when the clerk's office asked me after I sent it where to stick it on the agenda, I was in some meetings. So um, the second reading is for the actual ordinance. Uh, this right here, this item is just pertaining to the application. Uh, and the ordinance wasn't unanimously voted approved last time, so that's why there's a second reading. Okay, okay. 
All right. And everything that we covered yesterday. Yeah. In, so it's um, an application. We had talked about corrections. the uh, <clears throat> ADA. I just made that its own separate plan. I think that's important uh, to have it as its own plan because it should be on the building plans. Uh, and I did talk with Safe Built today, and they said that it wouldn't be a problem to help uh, us review that. So it's pretty standard stuff. Um, and then we talked about the. Uh, I just renamed step three to plans. Uh, and then charitable causes, I just limited it to the one sentence. I believe that's everything that we discussed. Okay. And I think the other thing is we pointed people to uh, EEO office. Uh, oh, yes. Plans, with their EEO plans. So, yeah, under employment plan, I changed uh, the second bullet point to equal employment opportunity plan to see uh, the city's EEO and employee relations director for assistance. That's Duana's position. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Mike. Okay. Anything else for Michael and Muffet? Mr. Turnquist? We had a lot of uh, con conversation about the charitable clauses, and I appreciate you cutting it down to the uh, one line. Uh, but further clarify that for me. Provide a statement on businesses intended charitable contribution. Is that asking them to state to you who they're going to contribute that money to? Yes. Uh, and, you know, I, I put a little more thought into it, too, yesterday. And, you know, as a follow-up question, I may ask them if they even if they would like to make that public. I think a lot of the applicants that we have spoken to, you know, I, was, I think there was some discussion on last yesterday whether that's appropriate or not. Um, but we really do see it uh, with some of these companies that state that they want to do it. And I think that they're fighting a stigma out there, so they want it to be known. And if, if they want us to share that, or you know, make it public when people ask. I think, you know, it's something that they may actually look at as a positive to let people know what they're doing. But you're not asking them to supply you with a specific amount and who they gave it to. Well, I think that's what it would be. It would be a plan to do that. It's not something that we're going to say, okay, you you're not going to donate to anybody. We're going to fail you. It's it's just a simple statement. So they can say nothing to nobody, and we would approve it. Or they can just give I a statement believe, of. I certainly believe in the charity and in giving. I have no problem with that. But as I sit here and you stand there, how much money did you give the charity last last year, Mike? And who did you give it to? It's none of my business. And they could probably put that in the application, and we'd be fine with it. Okay. okay. Any other questions, Mike? Commissioner German. Yeah. I just want to thank staff for the work and time and effort that they uh, put into this, uh, getting this application um, to the commission. And uh, even though I, you know, voted not to opt in, uh, there definitely has to be, you know, some type of regulations. And uh, I just want to commend you on that, uh, thank your you. efforts and the staff. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, okay. Roll call, please. Commissioner German? Yes. Commissioner Ritz Masipiga? Yes. Commissioner Turquist? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Mayor Galrin? Yes. Vice Mayor Hood? Yes. Commissioner Warren? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. New business, please. DDA on premise liquor license for Nipotes. Planning and Economic Development. Summary request to approve the resolution for a downtown development authority on premise liquor license for Nipotes. The Liquor Control Commission allows for additional uh, liquor licenses with downtown development authority districts under certain conditions. Staff recommendation to approve the resolution. <coughs> I move to approve the resolution. Second. It's been moved by Commissioner Johnson, second by Commissioner German to approve the resolution. Hi, Mike, you back? I'm back. Oh, good. So uh, I think you've all had a chance to see the renderings. It's a, a really cool idea. Yeah. Um, I was contacted six months, maybe longer ago. Uh, Mr. Jeff Church is here in the audience somewhere over here. He's the uh, business owner, and he can get up here and, and tell you a little bit more about the restaurant when I'm done. Um, but <laughs> I, <laughs> oh, you can start whining. <laughs> you can, right yeah, you can come on up now. <laughs> um, so you know, he told me about the concept and, and shipping containers, and we hear that from time to time. And I got a little bit worried, especially with it being in our form-based code. Uh, area with strict design guidelines, but he hired the right people and it just came out great and they were great to work with. Uh, we went back and forth on some things and 
Uh, really, it's just an amazing design uh, utilizing just uh, interesting materials. Um, it doesn't just look like a shipping container. Right. They're able to tear down the old blighted building that was falling apart. Um, and they're going to be opening up an Italian restaurant. And uh, some of the commissioners may also be happy to know that they are not serving pizza. They, <laughs> <laughs> they polled some of the citizens and they found out that there's already plenty of pizza options. So we're going to have a true Italian dining option. Uh, Pecheri, gnocchi, si, gnocchi. Ah, bene, bene. <laughs> Uh, so they also want a liquor license. They were unable to find one uh, in the county. It is in our DDA, so we have these licenses available, and they meet all of the criteria, so we're happy to uh, help them try to attain one here tonight. Very nice. Very nice. Okay, cool. Well, hey, you want to fill us in? Sure. We We met at the uh, tree lighting. We sure did. Yes, we did. Isn't that great <coughs> to see you again. Yeah, you too. Well, give us a thumbnail sketch of this uh, marvelous project. Well, we were... Uh, we, we thought we would get on the front end of what we feel is going to be it's, it's going to be huge with the with the shipping crates you know we ship them over and we don't ship them back so it's just a, a huge amount of them and it's stainless steel construction um, it they look really cool um, if, if we designed it right which I think I, I'm hoping you all had it I, I was under the impression you have, have seen it um, yeah so we just we figure Italian restaurant we got to have wine you know and, and we got to have limoncello and 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 good good beer too. So, um, yeah, that's what that's basically what we're looking to do: good food, good beer, family style. So, very good, very good. Um, commissioners, any questions for the uh, proprietor or for our staff? While well, we got him here in front of us, cannoli. I'll ask the question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it might I. Uh, Apologize if this was in the packet and I'm not remembering. Um, but timeline-wise, should people expect? Uh, we're we're optimistic for August. Okay. Um, that's pending. You know, if everything goes right, sure. which I'm sure we'll run into hiccups and everything like that. But the team we're working with is they're confident if if we get all our permits lined up and and we get really rolling on it that. 60 days is what they think then i would need another 30 days or so to, to get everybody trained and get mm -hmm. get the place staffed and everything so sure. yeah really uh three months from now i'm still looking into financing but that's looking really promising so yeah. it's uh yeah we we think three months from now it's 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 viable you know Fabulous. so definitely 2018. great but we're shooting for we're shooting for august good thank Fabulous. you Fabulous. commissioner johnson uh just thanks yeah, thanks for, no thanks for no investing in, in Muskegon. Thanks for looking at uh, opening up a, another alternative restaurant, you know, so adding, adding more variety um, yeah. and ethnicity to, to our downtown. Um, and I, I think it's a great location. And, and not only, you know, for your business, but in terms of our downtown development, um, you're pulling people from the heart of the city, the city center, down Clay Avenue, going to, to the Cheese Lady and Rats, and then coming down to your restaurant, and then helping to, to develop Pine Street, because I think Pine Street can be a major commercial corridor um, for our city, and I think this is a key step in, in connecting that Pine Street corridor with, with the rest of our yeah, downtown. We, we certainly hope so. Um, with having Morat's next door and the Cheese Lady next door to that, <coughs> the farmer's market across the street from that, we have, we have big plans for, for uh, you know, while working together, and we think for a weekend feature menu, we can we can source everything within the two blocks there. So I think that's going to be unique to the area too, and and you know everybody can have a piece of the pie, right? You know, there and you and we're we're really looking forward to it. We really hope it's it's the right place. Uh, we've looked in downtown for about two years now um, to find the right property, and 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 uh, we. We hope this is it. <laughs> now, now you keep it, on nodding be. over here to this uh, other individual. Yeah, that's, that's the, my wife, that's Sean. The partner? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's my wife. You. <laughs> Good to see you. Yeah. And it's it's nice too that the the, the uh, you're spearheading or leading with the the, the um, you know container ship design because I actually just heard from another property owner on Pine Street that's interested in bringing container ships in there. So I have to get them connected with your design company um, and check out your place um, and uh, maybe help spread that, that the design concept further. We know of one full service restaurant in Miami, and then there's a supper club in Tennessee. So I mean, really, we could be the, the third in the United States. Mm -hmm. So, you know, certainly the first to Michigan. So it's, uh, I think, you know, 
it'll be it'll be cool. Great stuff. Great stuff. <laughs> Quick question. Yeah. Okay, um, when it comes to your chefs, are they um, locally or from around here? Or are yep. you one of the chefs uh, and owner, or how does that work? Yep, I'm, I will be chef owner. I'm also going to have a head chef. Um, I, he asked me not to say his name yet because he's still at a place. But uh, yeah, I've I've worked. Uh, I own Jay Cheesy Dogs, uh, which I retired this year to to really work on this project. Um, and that was that was hot dogs and sausages and stuff like that. But uh, I was kitchen manager, head chef at Hobos okay. for the last ten years. So um, country club before that. And mm -hmm. Okay. Pretty pretty good, I think. So. Yeah. yeah. All right. That's good. Okay. Good luck. All right. Thank you. Again, best of luck. Thank you very much. Okay. Bravo. All set. Anything else? Okay. okay. You're all set. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Anything for Mike? We're all set. Roll call, please. Commissioner Risa Masipiga? Yes. Commissioner Turnquist? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Mayor Galrin? Yes. Vice Mayor Hood? Yes. Commissioner Warren? Yes. Commissioner German? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Item B, please. Medical Marijuana Facilities Licensing Act Planning Economic Development Second Reading Summary Request Request to approve the ordinance for the Medical Marijuana Facilities Licensing Act Staff Recommendation to approve the ordinance Commissioner Johnson I move to approve our Medical Marijuana Facilities Licensing Act opt-in ordinance Support it was moved by Commissioner Johnson, supported by Commissioner Rensmasabinga, to approve the Medical Marijuana Facilities Ordinance. Discussion? This is second reading. Okay. This is just everything that we basically talked right, about yesterday. Right, right. It was just yeah. that last thing we yeah, didn't have to make sure, yeah, on, on a new sure. ordinance. <coughs> just want to make sure. Okay. Roll call. Commissioner Turnquist. Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Mayor Galrin? Yes. Vice Mayor Hood? Yes. Commissioner Warren? Yes. Commissioner German? Yes. Commissioner Rensa Masipiga? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. <laughs> Item C, please. Amendment to the Zoning Ordinance, Medical Marijuana Facilities Licensing Act Overlay District Planning Economic Development. Summary request. Staff initiated request to amend the zoning ordinance to include a new section for the Medical Marijuana Facilities Overlay District. Staff recommendation. Staff recommends approval of the ordinance amendment. Committee recommendation. The Planning Commission voted in favor 4-2 of recommending to the City Commission to approve the zoning ordinance amendment for the MMFLA overlay district at their February 15th meeting. Mahalski, Larson, Galrin, and Doyle voted in support. Ms. Aide and Montgomery Keese voted in opposition. Peterson and Hubby Wright were absent. The version they approved for recommendation is slightly different than from what staff is presenting tonight, as this version allows, allows all types of licenses with one overlay district zone, rather than restricting licenses between two separate overlay districts. Commissioner Rinsma saving I move to approve the, sorry, lost the page, the amendment to the zoning ordinance related to medical marijuana facilities, licensing act overlay district. Support. Then moved by Commissioner Rinsma saving supported by Commissioner Warren. To approve uh, the ordinance referencing the medical marijuana facilities overlay district. Any discussion? Commissioner German. Okay, this is where I kind of struggled at, uh, well, not really struggled. I just felt that uh, when it comes to the regulation portion of it uh, and the application piece, I know there has to be some type of uh, regulations. With this overlay part, um, this is where, you know, I kind of look at certain areas that, uh, to me, I think we should have looked at other areas and just kind of, you know, had more discussion on where we want to do the overlay. Due to the zoning, though, I know there are some restrictions. But um, this is one reason why I'm, I'm going to, um, I'm opposing this here. I'm not going to vote in favor of this, even though I didn't vote to opt in also, because I just felt that there were too many loose ends. Um, <clears throat> I'm all in support of regulations. and when. You know, the process <coughs> moves forward. Um, I'm not against patients having, you know, their medical marijuana. Uh, let that be known as well. But I won't be voting in favor of this. Thank you. Anything else? 
Commissioner Johnson. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, I, too, had had some concerns about the relative restrictions to the overlay district, but um, I'm satisfied with this as a starting point, um, and uh, hopefully in the future we will uh, reconsider uh, other areas that uh, would be suitable um, for at least the provisioning centers, because um, honestly it's medicine, and you know, where we have pharmacies, provisioning centers should be permitted, and I believe they should also be permitted in medical care um, districts, and so I would like us to reconsider this in the future. And maybe that would, um, you know, alleviate or address some of Commissioner German's concerns as well. Um, but I'm satisfied with where we're at right now as a starting point. Um, and I'm just on a final note, I want to thank um, staff, my fellow commissioners, um, the public, um, for all their time and effort on this matter and uh, getting us to this point. Um, it's been many, 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 many months and scores of hours. Heck, we spent four hours last night, most of which was on uh, this topic. And so I just want to express my appreciation to everyone involved that we are, um, you know, moving forward. And I, and I especially want to thank the commissioners tonight for unanimously approving the opt-in ordinance on its second read. I think that demonstrates that our city um, is uh, solidly a compassionate uh, and caring uh, community. And so I appreciate all of you. Thank you. You're right, we spent much time on it. Commissioner Warren and I were <coughs> carrying blisters. Um, roll call, please. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Mayor Goldman? Yes. Vice Mayor Hood? Yes. Commissioner Warren? Yes. Commissioner German? No. Commissioner Rinsko Sipica? Yes. Commissioner Turnquist? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Item D, please. Demolition of 1713 and 1747 7th Street, a.k.a. Park Street Storage, Public Safety. Summary of request. The Director of Public Safety requests that the Commission authorize the amount of $220,000 for the demolition and removal of debris and hard surface foundations, parking lots, etc., that remain at the location commonly known as Park Street Storage. The building and adjacent lot is dangerous and abandoned and is a source of public safety issues. The building has no functional use and is in disrepair. Staff recommendations. Staff recommends approval of the demolition of 1713 and 1747 7th Street. Vice Mayor. I move to uh, recommend approval of the uh, demolition to 1713 and 1747 7th Street. Support. It's been moved by the Vice Mayor, supported by <coughs> Commissioner Rinsma Saving uh, to approve the demolition of 1713 and 1747 7th Street. Well, hi, good, Chief. Uh, good after, or good evening. You got some information for us? I sure do. Um, this uh, structure, Park Street Storage, located on 7th Street and also on the adjacent street, Park Street, um, has been a source of um, contention for about five years now. It's gone to our uh, Housing Board of Appeals a couple times to be uh, demoed. Um, we made every effort we could to work with the previous owner. Um, the actual owner um, was deceased and went into a trust. We then worked with the, uh, the individuals in charge of the trust. And uh, even at one point, he had contacted um, a demo company to remove the building, simply because if you drive by it, even from street side, you can tell um, the decay, the irregular way the building was continually added on to. Um, it's, it's just virtually a mess down there. Um, the parking lots, you'll see all the pictures we gave you. Parking lots are full of grass and trees. Um, we have been down there on fires. Recently we were doing a walkthrough and there was some homeless people living inside there that we had to get out because they were right by an area where there was a collapse and this goes on and on and on. So we um, again um, went through the process and it now has become a public property. So now we're moving to demo this property. Um, we reconnected with the, um, the demo company, Melching, who had done quite a few walkthroughs through there. They also did an asbestos um, survey of the property, which usually takes many, many weeks to do. That was already done. So we asked them for a bid now that it's in our control. And I put that in your packet, and you can see where it's approximately $150,000 to demo the building, which seems very expensive. And also, we determined to remove all those hard surfaces, the concrete, and the foundation, simply because if we don't, um, that could cause us problems later with leaving all that hard surface in place. 
So Melching had came back and they, because um, they had the history with the building, they already did the survey. They gave us a total bid of $220,000. And they even explained in there that um, they're giving us um, the benefit of the doubt of this proposal because there's quite a bit of scrap material in there that we'll get credit for. And um, the fact they've already done some other surveys in there, um, it helped def you know defray or defer the cost down to the 220,000 that you see in this bid. So um, myself, Jay Paulson, Kirk um, got together and we forwarded this to you because we think this is, I guess, the best remedy for this property. Um, we don't feel it should continue. Um, it's in disrepair. It's, it's a non-functional building. We can't see any way to rehabilitate it. And we actually have interest in neighboring companies and businesses that are, are functional. I think our city manager can talk to that of what maybe the future plan for this site is once it gets um, you know, demolished and um, the property cleared up. And also just a note on the south end of this um, building, we have a bike trail that goes through there and it will, it will open up our bike trail, won't make it so like dangerous tonight to pass through this area with this dangerous building. It'll open the whole area up. It's right by the mission. I think it'll be a good move for us to finally <coughs> after decades to get this building down and uh, make way for um, the property to be rehabilitated or something new in that location. A couple of years ago, we had a wall collapse onto the sidewalk. Yeah, I mean, it's just been ongoing like that, yes. So. Questions for Chief? Commissioner German? Is this yes, the old MISCO plant, uh, Hombat yep. plant mm -hmm. part of the, okay, that's the building you're talking about. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Commissioner yeah. Yeah. Turnquist? You mentioned that we're getting the credit for the salvageable material. Is that already in there with the 220000 No, if, if they, um, like they're talking about in the proposal, we're getting so-called credit for that, um, which may not be the case if we went to another company. But that's why we there is a time limit on this bid because um, scrap obviously was up. And as it plummets, um, they'll have to, uh, have to absorb the cost. They even talked in here just since they've given the bid. Um, it has gone down somewhat to where they'll absorb the $8,000 that they have seen in the scrap going downward. And that's not usually something I'll see in a written bid where we get any kind of credit for anything that's in the building. But this is such a large complex, I think there is scrap material in there. Richard Johnson? So we're funding this out of our public improvement fund. Um, we have exhausted our demolition funds that were allocated from the community development block grant. Um, but I'm wondering, <coughs> could have the CDBG monies earmarked for demolition be used for commercial de demolition? Because that's the issue with this one, why it's taking so long to demolish, is that <coughs> the state grant monies for demolition was just for house, you know, fighting blight um, and tearing down homes. So um, while state monies couldn't have been used for this, could we have used the CDBG for, for demolition of commercial properties or industrial for that well, matter? Anita's probably a better person to answer that. My guess is that we do have the opportunity to do slum and blight abatement as part of that, so there probably would be an opportunity. Um, but I don't know, you know, I don't know for sure without without talking with her. We do have, um, I think, $150,000 yes. budgeted in public improvement for demolitions mm -hmm. this year. So really what we're looking for is, is the difference between, you know, 150 and 200, so that extra $70,000, that's mm -hmm. not, that's not budgeted for at this point in the, in the, in, you know, anywhere in the um, budget. Okay, thank you. I'll yeah. confer with uh, Ms. Yeah. Bailey. The, the yeah, man I can have her email the group too if you'd like. Mm -hmm. the, the manager is correct. And like I said, if we were to wait, um, the, the cost could go up as high as $100,000. And that's one thing we're trying to avoid right now. And we did budget 150,000 for this project back last year at this time. Mm -hmm. right. Very good. Okay. Anything else? Roll call, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Mayor Gowron? Yes. Vice Mayor Hood? Yes. Commissioner Warren? Yes. Commissioner German? Yes. Commissioner Rins Mississippiga? Yes. Commissioner Turnquist? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Santos, you still here? You are. Hey, we have a uh, current issue with uh, some concerns with uh, Oakville. Correct. Um, you probably all received messages from concerned citizens. We uh, made the decision last week to uh, close down the 
this golf course at McGrath Park. Um, that is a decision that I think that we've been discussing probably since last fall. Not really discussing closing of the disc golf course, but what we were going to do to try and cut off or minimize uh, the effects of oak wilt, the effects that oak wilt could have to McGrath Park. Um, for those of you who don't know, oak wilt is basically caused by a fungus that is transmitted by a beetle, um, or it can be transmitted below the soil between roots, so basically root grafting. Um, we became aware of this problem several years ago that it, it, it has become a greater issue in Michigan. Uh, you can get on the DNR website or Michigan State's website and look at maps of uh, oak wilt and what it does to uh, the, the major all species of oaks really, but mainly red oaks and black oaks are, are really hard hit by this disease. So um, going back to McGrath Park, last fall um, the forestry department mostly myself, noticed that some of the discs were causing injury to the trees in, in, in McGrath. Um, it's, it's visual, you can see it yourself, or if you're there during, you know, when we've got some really powerful disc golfers, so it's audible too, you can hear the, the hits to the trees. Um, that combined with, the, with some of the damage that we noticed, um, we decided to bring up the subject again this spring, and um, talking with some experts and also our uh, certified arborist on staff, we came up with the, the, the decision basically to close down the, the disc golf um, course until such time as we can perhaps come up with some ideas on how to uh, reduce the probability that we could have a problem there. Currently, we do not have any instances of oak wilt that I know of in the park. Um, the fact of the matter is that McGrath Park is a heritage park it's over 100 years old. Uh, most of the oak trees in McGraft are 100 plus years old. Um, it is a densely packed uh, set of oaks in, in McGraft. And it's not just McGraft, it's also Glenside neighborhood. This oak, upland oak forest basically extends from McGraft Park into Norton Shores. So we know that we have instances of oak wilt in uh, Hoffmaster right now, and they're dealing with uh, remediation. Remediation for this particular disease is not cheap. Uh, we can be talking anywhere between $900 to $1,800 uh, to treat a single tree, and that's multiple treatments. And then we would be looking at an additional cost for possible trenching, uh, and that's per tree. And then there is no guarantee that we are going to save the tree. It can still die. So, uh, you know, we're potentially looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars of damage, uh, not just to McGrath Park, but also to Glenside, um, to so all of Muskegon, really, if we if we get hit. So we're trying to basically look at um, the disease the the disease burden you know areas and trying to prevent that from happening. Now I've talked with a lot of people in the last couple of days. Um, <coughs> I've had some really great conversations with uh, maybe perhaps some people that are in this room um, about this. So I think that what we can do right now is continue to work with the community to maybe come up with some solutions that would allow us to open up the disc golf course again. Um, and and hopefully, you know, continue to learn about this this disease that has a very high mortality rating. Um, it would be devastating if it were to hit here in Muskegon. We really have some some beautiful oak species, some heritage or what I call it, specimen trees in, in the community that would really be devastating if we lost them. So I think that's what we're we're trying to to accomplish right now. All right. Okay. Any questions for Mr. Santos? Uh, that I know that we all received uh, information on this uh, last week, uh, bringing us up to snuff on the uh, potential threat and uh, safety measures to be taken, at least in the near term, uh, as, as we you know make determinations. I, I can tell you that this is also a very hard thing to diagnose because the uh, it, the underland the the subsoil side of this, the root grafting, that can be diagnosed fairly easily. You isolate a tree and then you move on from there and kind of work your way out. Um, it is more difficult to address the overland, uh, you know, the overland infections. So, um, you know, a lot of the comments that we've had recently from um, people in the community have been, you know, how do you, how, do you, how do you plan to mitigate this when you have, you know, woodpeckers out there pecking on the trees or you've got storm damage or you've got, you know, any number of natural factors. So we've taken all that into consideration. and. 
uh, really, you know, it's, it's a very good point, but at the same time, we have to try and reduce the amount of human damage that we're doing to these trees. So if they're being hit a couple hundred times by a disc golf um, or by a disc, then I think that's more of a risk perhaps than something else that's happening or occurring naturally. And the forestry department is taking these things into consideration when we do have storm damage. Um, our forestry team has been uh, tasked to paint the wounds over with latex spray paint and a number of other techniques that we're, we're also still learning about, basically, um, to try and minimize the, uh, the effects to the trees. Very good. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Santos. <coughs> oh, you did have a question. I'm sorry. Not, Mr. Not Johnson. A question, per se. Um, just some commentary, I suppose. Um, that I can, it's, I appreciate that we are uh, trying to be, you know, exist as harmoniously as possible with nature and not do any damage um, to our trees. Um, these are these are majestic old oaks that, that we want to keep around. Um, and so I do appreciate staff um, being proactive um, in this regard. Um, but, uh, and I also know it's very distressing to many people in our community, the, the loss of disc golf and that it happened so suddenly. Um, I wish that we had been maybe a bit more proactive in our communication to, to the community. Um, and I do understand that you and staff have personally reached out to some key stakeholders in the disc golf community to let them know. So I do appreciate that. Um, but I, I know that many people felt like just kind of blindsided by this um, and that maybe it was a knee-jerk reaction. Um, I don't think it's a knee-jerk reaction considering you've been um, uh, reflecting on this and, and looking into this for, for many months now. Um, I would just strongly encourage that we, uh, and I'm, I'm confident that you will, um, exhaust all options um, to uh, mitigate this and preserve our oaks while still allowing disc golfing um, at McGrath Park. Um, and if we got to get creative and think outside of the box, you know, let, let's do it, you know, and, and look at uh, reasonable uh, approaches that aren't necessarily going to break the bank. Um, and even if it is costly, let's start brainstorming how we can do that maybe collaboratively um, and not just coming out of our, our coffers, per se. One thing I've tried to, to tell our citizens, too, that have called and our community members is that um, there's nothing nefarious going on at the city of Muskegon. We didn't do this because we hate disc golf. Um, you know, we, we look at this. In fact, today I was at McGrath Park, and it is living in that neighborhood, it is strange to me that there was nobody there. Hmm. Um, this is a huge thing that, that we don't want to lose, but we had to weigh this between that and, you know, the, the potential factors from this disease. So I'm sure all of you are familiar with emerald ash borer. We are still yep. dealing with ash borer. Uh, we've, the city of Muskegon has spent thousands and thousands of dollars on ash borer remediation. Mm -hmm. So um, when we look at something like this that has the potential to hit our community this hard, a community with so many large oak trees, um, that's kind of where I think the, the manager and the director took, looked at this and made the decision to go ahead and, and, and take the action that we felt was necessary. But we're gonna continue working with these folks. Um, there's got to be a solution. So if there is one, we'll find it. Mm -hmm. I do have a question, then, I guess. Yes. Um, which uh, Leanne answered earlier, but maybe you could answer for the, for the public what our kind of our timeline is um, in terms of this assessment and whom we're bringing in uh, resource-wise to, to examine this um, and when we might have some kind, when we might be able to expect some kind of uh, next steps or, or resolution. So. So the research tells us that oak wilt, the worst times for it to hit are April 15th to, through July 15th. Um, but then again, we are now hearing from other experts telling us that any months that the beetle can be viable um, and be out doing its thing, we could potentially be, have a problem. So we're looking at whether or not if we have a reduced risk in that window of time and that we could maybe start up after this and before it, um, we're looking at maybe a couple of different measures to somehow protect the trees, and I don't know how viable that is. We still have to, to study that, I guess, or look at it closer. Um, so, you know, I think that with the input that we're getting from the community, we can continue to, to look for some kind of solution because I surely won't, I don't want to see that stop at McGrath Park. Mm -hmm. um, but then we, we have the needs of the community to look at, too. Mm -hmm. And we're getting, from what I understand um, from Mrs. Mike Sell, that we're going to be getting some signage um, at McGrath Park informing and educating people what happened with the baskets, why they were taken down, and what the problem is. Can we also have those signs say, 
hey, we also have um, nine holes uh, for disc golfing at Richards Park. Just kind of divert them elsewhere and let them know that that's there. Right. Um, although I'm sure if you're an avid disc golfer, you know it already exists. But Yeah, we're looking for some signage from a couple different companies that deal with Oak Will. Um, where we may produce some ourselves just to put them out there and put them in key locations in the park. Um, and then we hope to just continue to maybe put some information on our website and, and do some more community outreach. Mm -hmm. You know, we've spoken to the neighborhood associations. Um, I think that the more we speak with people out there, it becomes more clear that this is a reasonable measure that we're not trying to do anything to harm, you know, this program. Yeah, absolutely. The more transparency and uh, being forthright um, about what's going on, um, I think absolutely. is well received and respected by the community. So I appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other uh, business to bring before the uh, commission, commissioners, Mr. Manager, staff members? If not, we can open up for public participation. Members of the public are welcome to come forward. Um, we invite you up for uh, questions or comments. Sometimes we don't have all the answers, so we refer you to other people that might have you know, the answers, maybe not necessarily this evening, but we can put you in uh, contact with staff uh, who would be uh, glad to make contact with you uh, following the meeting <coughs> and in the future. Uh, each individual is given uh, three minutes. And I do have, first, uh, Kara Schrader on behalf of McGrath uh, Park Ladies League Disc Golf. And if we could just get your... Uh, Name and your address, Ms. Schrader, just for the uh, clerk's record. My name is Kara Schrader, and I live at 933 Ireland Avenue, 49441. Um, we, we know, you know, um, this has kind of blindsided us, so we, we prepared a statement so there wouldn't be, we would do this properly. So um, we, there's a group of us here that are here on behalf of McGrath Park Ladies Disc Golf League, which is a league that we do every Tuesday night. Right. Well, we did. <laughs> um, recent events have led to the removal of the baskets at McGrath Park. We have been informed by city officials that the reasons for this removal is concern over disc golf possibly spreading the tree disease known as oak wilt. We are fully aware that oak wilt is a real threat and can be fatal for the affected but untreated trees. However, there has never been a single documented case correlating the spread of this disease via the disc itself. We frequently wish the city to know that the disc golf is extremely beneficial to not only one's personal health, but also the community as a whole. Local businesses and tourism reap the benefits of those who come from other areas to sample our many disc courses at Dot West Michigan. The revenue is not there without the visitors to entice, without the wonderful, sorry, places such as at McGrath and other disc courses to entice visitors. Disc golf is a wonderful way to relieve stress and get exercise outdoors. The growth of this sport is moving at a phenomenal rate of a 13% year increase in equipment, sales, membership, and participation from the general public. The disc golf community is a wonderful group of people that are more than willing to contribute in any way they can, either through raising donations for future improvements or physically working towards development and or supporting research on a long-term solution. Thank you very much on behalf of the whole disc golf community and McGrath Park Ladies League. And thank you, Ms. Schrader. And as you heard, we're motivated to do all that we can so that we can, you know, preserve, you know, this great activity. And uh, like I say, sometimes science is more art. And, <laughs> but but we but we uh, you know we we are. Uh, um, you know, tasked with, you know, preserving our natural heritage as well, but we'll do all that we can so that moving forward we can, you know, get things back up and, and running. And uh, staff will work, you know, diligently with you and the rest of the public, you know, to that end. And, and we did give a copy of this to the Parks um, Commissioner so that she has our contact information. Very good. And we're, we're very willing to help. You know, we want a solution. Very good. I appreciate Thank you. it. Diane. Uh, 
Good evening. Um, my name is Diane Foster, address 135 Ottawa Street, Skegan, Michigan, 49442. I thought I was going to come up here and talk about medical marijuana, but I will for a minute and just tell you thank you for um, moving along with this. Um, it has sparked a great interest in our city, in case anybody doesn't know that. Um, but the thing with McGrath Park has really sparked an interest with me. Um, I didn't even know about it till I got here tonight. So this is what I have to say really quickly. My first husband's father was a lumber baron. And one thing nice about trees, you can replant them. They are plant, you can grow them again. Yes, things happen to them. The second thing I want to say is, is that if you asked any man here or woman who plays golf, we were going to close your golf course because your golf balls were hitting the trees. I'm pretty sure you'd get a lot of resistance at that. So, and I'm sure that they're going to have just as much trouble with their oak trees at the golf courses if this is the case. I, I find that the golf course, the, the, I don't disc golf, but I do see a lot of people that do. It's so mentally good and so physically good for people that aren't capable of um, harder sports. Skiing, even regular golfing is probably more taxing in some respects. But for people that are disabled, it is a really good sport. And you're taking a sport away now that the disabled are able to play. So I, in an area that is really accessible for them, easy for them to get around in, and I think McGrath is beautiful, and I love trees, and I love oak trees probably more than any other one on the planet. But I really feel that, like you said, science is about love sometimes. and. God knows I love nature, but I just don't think that, the, I'd like to know how many trees the dust are hurting. And well, that's what, what we're going to you know, you know, we're, we're probably going to, you know, right. that's, I'm attempt just saying, to, we're, we're going to we'll attempt to that. make that, you know, determination. Good. Okay. Good. And, but in, in the interim, we are tasked. Oh, I know. We can to preserve I just upon don't see hundreds. you spending $900 a tree to fix them, though, either. So I don't know, or more and, and, per tree. And, and the, to, to my point. Right. Okay, we don't so have we do probably need 900. to come up with a better solution. Right. Right now, that's what we're trying to I prevent. Agree. Okay? All right. So I'm just and, we're, and we're not that trying to do anything against anybody. No. We're I'm trying just going to say that, that I was shocked everybody. about okay. that. Thank you. So, and that's not so. Fair, mm -hmm. just to like cut me off like that. I just wanted to tell you that oh, you're this a, you're is something you should at, uh, two seconds. think about. Well, All right, thank I you. Right. Donald Jensen. <coughs> Hi there. My name is Donald Jensen, 1488 Nolan Street, Muskegon, Michigan. I own Sweet Spot Disc Golf. I've been playing at McGrath since. 2003, uh, I understand Oakwell to problem at Hoffmaster, it's a problem in this state and other areas, Traverse City, it's been brought in by contaminated firewood. There's not one case that we know of of disc golf causing, opening a doorway for this disease to transfer. Nobody can prove that, it's, it hasn't happened. So we're, the community, the disc golf community is kind of upset. This was almost done in the middle of the night and the baskets were gone. It was done at eight in the morning. I had talked to somebody from the Parks Department yesterday It told me there was a reaction from an article on M Live last week from somebody sitting up here that read it. It had to do with Nestrum Park and the neighbors that didn't like the activity at their park. They raised a few questions in uh, items about disc golfers and then it turned to Oak Wilt and they essentially got that park shut down. There's no Oak Wilt at Nestrum, there's no Oak Wilt at McGrath that we know of. Oak Will in this area has been strong for five years. McGrath's been there for 19 years. The last five years, we still don't have any, any, any indication of Oak Wilt there. If a beetle's gonna fly into that forested, dense area, it's gonna find those trees, whether it's across Sherman and Glenside from the neighbors pruning, 
when they're not supposed to. I've seen three huge trees over at McGrath and nobody do anything to them. So you were talking about surface marks from discs, yet you got three foot circumference trees that the city said, or somebody says that we're concerned about oak wilt, oak wilt going back a couple of years, but where's the action on it when you have something exposed like that? So now we're looking at nicks in the trees. These oak trees are old and have a lot of heavy bark on them. I'm not saying they don't get damaged, but the softer trees are the ones that show the marks on them the most, and they're, they're maple and beech trees. So yes, there's bark damaged here and there. I haven't went, went over it with a fine tooth comb. I don't know how bad they're damaged, but there's no incident in the state of Michigan yet of this. So it almost seems like a knee jerk reaction. Why now and why how? Why did this happen like this? Why not, if you've been thinking about it, why not in the winter plan this out so you don't slam it in our face and steal the baskets in the middle of the night? That's essentially what happened. And whoever said about, you know, this community, I've made a living off having a store. There's not many stores that sell just baseball equipment and survive. We've done this with disc golf. It's the fastest growing sport that's given in the country. It's given Muskegon a little bit of progressiveness, a little bit of hipness. I can't tell you how many times the Chamber of Commerce has called me and said, hey, we want you in our magazine. We want to, sh we want to showcase this. And now a knee jerk reaction to remove the baskets and say, well, we don't really know what we're going to do. Essentially, the season just started. We, we go through a miserable winter and we were like, yes, this, this golf season started and then the baskets are gone. I mean, it, it's been a slap in the face. I, nobody wants the trees to get damaged. Nobody wants to see the disease prevail. But how this was handled, you know, that probably could have been discussed and then made a decision on it. Why now? We've been playing there for the past five years with Oakwell at Hoffmaster. There's no indication of any spread. Branches, you ever been through there in a wind, windstorm? There's hundreds of branches laying out all over the place. There's trees falling over. Nobody does anything about it. If that beetle, if a beetle's going to come because of a frisbee, they're going to come be, because of a million other reasons too. So that's pretty much, you know, we hope that we can find a resolution for this. There's no way to take 400 oak trees and cover them with plastic because you'd have to do it from the ground to 75 feet. So I don't know what the solution is, but what's the probability of us throwing disc and increasing the chances of oak wilt spreading is, is the bottom line. <coughs> uh, we're going to work our tail off to come to a resolution. And uh, I know there's somebody who lives in my house that wants it resolved because he plays disc golf. Yeah, well, there's, there, you know, there's over 400 courses in the state. So Muskegon is the one place that's removing the courses. Okay. So, you know, it's, it's Watch us go backwards. <laughs> well. We go <laughs> and now we're in neutral. This is a snapshot in time. Our staff is taking what action they deem necessary at this time with what is a potential threat. We will work through this so that it doesn't become a disaster of a reality. Let us get our heads around this so that we are shown to be making, you know, the prudent move. This isn't a, a matter of going out after anybody. Right. It's no. a matter of preserving our biological heritage. And I don't know what article you were referring to because the <clears throat> only thing I saw was from, you know, research out of Michigan State that was sent to us. And, uh, but again, it, it may be hard not to take it personally, especially, you know, you're making a living from it or you're, you're active users. But this is bigger than all of us, potentially. So, you know, let us get our head around this, work it through with you. Right. So that we can all move forward together. I, w I would like to say I live by there and I've been through there the past three or four times in the past day. The park is essentially a dead zone now. Mm -hmm. There's nobody there. Maybe that's well, I don't think that's what they Diane, want. Diane, it is not what we want. I don't think that's what you want, but that's what has happened as a consequence. Uh, yes, it would, because you know, you, you can't play. Right. Let's make sure that this is temporary. Let us do our due diligence. We want to work with you. We want to find a resolution. And you heard right from Mr. Santos that that's what we all want to do as well. 
All right, good okay. enough. We'll we'll see you down the road. Okay. Tourette's. Are there any other members of the public that would like to address the commission? If not, Vice Mayor. If there's nothing else, I move to adjourn. Support. It's been moved by the Vice Mayor, supported by Commissioner Rinsma Savinga to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you very much.